Hi, welcome back to our entrepreneur interview series. And today we're talking with Jennifer Neal, who is a mindset and business coach. She's known for her no BS approach, which you know, we love that here because we have no BS. She's on a mission to put more money in the hands of more women online. And after getting lost in a sea of Facebook groups, and funnels, and we have all done that. She went from car repossessed, strugglepreneur, to making six figures online once she ditched doing it all and made success simple. And she's gonna be sharing a couple of great tips with you, one on what sales activities you need to do if you're a solopreneur or a CEO, and one on what to do when your offers kind of plateau or they're no longer converting. So some great info, stick around for her tips on that. And Jennifer, welcome. So great to have you here. Thank you. I'm so excited to talk with you today. I'm really looking forward to everything we're going to dive into. First, I want you to tell me a little bit about your business, how and why you started and kind of where you've come since then. Yeah. So my, uh, why I started is interesting. Um, I actually got started in the coaching space. Six years ago now, I was in my early 20s trying to quote unquote figure out my purpose, decided to get a coaching certification, and then I was off to the races online where, as my intro kind of said, I got lost in the groups and the funnels and the periscope and the lead gen, and it just, it was an absolute headache and nightmare, Um, but I eventually built up a six-figure business as a spiritual coach. And that's really where my business evolved more into the business and mindset side of things, because a lot of the women that I was working with really didn't understand how to, they went through exactly what I had gone through. They didn't understand how to market themselves online, how to create an irresistible offer and how to actually grow their business beyond doing one-on-ones or done for you work. So that's um, why I am where I am today. Um, I really am passionate about helping women of all walks of life just make more money online, whether it doesn't matter what type of business you have, because I feel like we deserve it. We need it. Women on this planet don't need to struggle anymore. We've got a lot to say and a lot to give. So let's do it. (laughs) I talk all the time with female entrepreneurs who same thing, they get lost in all the Facebook groups and on everybody telling them, oh, you have to do this and you have to do that. And it may not be right for your business. So I think we've all gone down those rabbit holes, at least to some extent and have to, at some point kind of stop and take a step back and focus and strategize on what's right for me. And now we're getting a little bit further past the effects of the pandemic and the quarantine, but what did you experience in your business and has it made you pivot and change your services at all? Yeah, the um, pandemic actually didn't affect me in business too much because at the time I really was focused on my high-end one-on-one client work. So I wasn't really doing any online marketing. I had taken a break from that because um, I started working with a startup as well two years ago. It's an all-in-one platform to build your business online. So the pandemic was really, unfortunately, not so fruitful for most people, but very fruitful for myself because I already had the clients that I was working with and it was a perfect opportunity for us to focus on growing the startup as well. So um, now that the, you know, we are out of the pandemic and I can turn my, my attention back onto my business, I have been starting to ramp up online um, with marketing and moving away from my one-on-one clients. I do have a few um, memberships that I'm planning on launching in the next couple of months, but it really, um, I'm, I'm very blessed, quite frankly, I feel like with what my experience was business-wise in the pandemic. I've had a few clients who actually, when it first happened, were expecting a large negative impact. And luckily, most of them held okay. And some of them actually found new business and were doing better than before. So everyone, I think, was scared for a while. But now that we're on the other side of it, for the most part, and hindsight is 2020, I think that level of uncertainty helped people 
plan, make new plans and pivot, which maybe they might not have done otherwise. And it's actually helped their business for sure. Back when you were starting, what were your biggest marketing issues? When I first started, my biggest marketing issues, I mean, number one is just the sheer overwhelm. There is a, if you don't know anything about business, which I didn't, I um, didn't, I don't have a business degree. I was really just learning as I went. My biggest issue, number one, was the sheer overwhelm in not knowing where to spend my time or energy. Just like you had said, we all kind of get lost in everybody telling you that you need to do it a certain way or this certain way will guarantee results. Well, as we know, there's no guarantee in business. And the best way to even kind of get a guarantee is to really just do it the way that works best for you. Um, so really just not knowing where to spend my time and attention. Should I do this strategy? Should I do this strategy? Should I do this and this? And so that I would say was number one. And number two, um, I, you know, I think we were meant to touch on this a little bit later, but not understanding how long it takes like how consistent you have to be no matter what. You've got to kind of get through the trudges. You've got to build a community. You have to give things time to flourish and build up. There's no immediate results. So that was also a big shift that I had to make. I always hear from so many people, they need advice for marketing or business or anything. And you go to Google and you get 81 million results. <laughs> And you ha yeah, you don't know if the information you're getting is good. Is it bad? Will it work for you and your business and your audience and just the way, like you said, the way you want to work naturally? So the overwhelm is real. And segueing into that, which you probably touched upon a bit, is what do you wish someone had told you about being an entrepreneur before you started? Absolutely. Just... I, I wish I had somebody as clear, no BS as I am with my clients at all stages. I wish I had that person to just cut through the BS, cut to the chase with me and tell me, look, you're not going to get results overnight. Look, stop paying attention to the bright and shiny object. Look, doing it the way everybody else is doing it isn't going to work. Stick with one strategy, show up consistently, let things grow, let things build. Just, just that real raw to the chase. This is how it is. I wish somebody gave that to me because again, I mean, and, and, and we know, we know this with marketing and with sales and with copywriting, there's, there's a lot of great copywriters out there. There's a lot of great ads out there. And I was so caught up in that of the bright and shiny, have a 20K month, a complete passive income, da, 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 build your business overnight. Like, it, so I, I was really sold. <laughs> I, was, I was an easy sell on all of those things. And I wish somebody would have just honestly taken my laptop away from me. <laughs> <laughs> no more laptop for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I see a lot of, a lot of people come to me becoming clients and what they've experienced is that, you know, they did all those things, a $20,000 month and you know, all those. What happens is that the person selling it to you has only learned that method that they're going to teach you that one right. method and nothing else. And so it it can't be personalized. It can't connect to maybe existing other systems you've set up. I've helped quite a few entrepreneurs clean up where they had like three or four email programs, you know, email service providers like MailChimp and Constant Contact, because each of those programs and coaches and whatever that they signed up for had to use a different one. And they didn't know how to connect it to the one that you already had. And I'm like, this is the worst thing you can do because that's how clients fall through the cracks. Information falls through the cracks. You double up on what it costs because you're paying each one of them. Yep. You're tripling your time because if you do want to make sure everybody gets in the right buckets in each one, you're having to do it manually. It's just sad to me that the person really making the money is the one guy or girl who yeah. started it 
the whole program and the person who's selling you that little one you bought may not actually be making that much money. <laughs> so yep. I, I, I hate to see that it's all cookie cutter. Now, having said that, it's better to start anywhere sure. than to be so frozen with so much overwhelming information that you don't do anything. Yeah, start where you are, but at some point you need to really get strategic about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, especially if somebody's starting out or still finding their way, I always say, find your flow first, then optimize. Find, find, and when I say find your flow, that does encompass strategy. Pick the one strategy that you're most attracted to, that feels manageable to you. It feels doable. The um, audience that you want to target, they're, you know, they're a part of that. Uh, they're, they're showing up where you're showing up and just stick with that and just, just go with the flow. So you get the rhythm down, you get the consistency down, you get all of that down, then optimize, then worry about all of the tactics that that stuff comes later, get your strategy down first, get your rhythm and your flow down first in your business. Because, you know, a, a lot of people we're, we're speaking to you right now, whether you're just starting or you've been in business for 10 years, you're still probably doing most of it yourself. Maybe you're outsourcing a little bit here and there, but at the end of the day, you don't have a team of 20. It's, it's primarily you. So if you don't have that down and you don't build that solid foundation, you're, you're just going to stay stuck. You're just, you're never going to really grow, grow and move on. And to what you're saying about the multiple platform, I, I could go on about that for days. That's part of why I started working with the startup Freebird that I'm a part of. I ne I, you know, I've had my own business for years. I never really imagined doing something like that, but I was so lit up to find something that truly is all in one. And not only is it robust enough for people who are more advanced and want to customize wherever they are in their business, it's simple enough for people who are just starting out and they're tech adverse or they're overwhelmed with all of these different integrations and tools and platforms. And, you know, we, you touched on this earlier about money. It, I, you're on a budget as a beginning entrepreneur. And even if you're not, why do you want to be wasting money on five, six, seven different platforms when number one, it's probably causing you overwhelm. So there's a mindset and an energy thing there. Um, it's costing you time because it's time consuming, logging into this, logging into that, figuring out what platform isn't connecting to, to this platform. Did I miss a client? Did they get this? Did they not? I don't, it's just, it's not efficient. It's silly. And it doesn't have to, I mean, it's 2021. It really doesn't have to be like that anymore. True, definitely true. And anytime you can, automate and make sure things are connected. Even if you're using what is now kind of old fashioned Zapier, you know, yeah. you definitely want to do that. I caught one of the things you mentioned about showing up consistently. You hear a lot of talk about, you have to be authentic, you know, on your, on your social media, whatever, you have to be authentic. And that is true. But one of the things that Seth Godin, who's one of the best people at teaching sales, tells us is that your prospective customers don't really want you to be authentic. They don't care if you're authentic. They care if you're consistent. And having that consistency in what you do, even when you're starting out at a small level, if you're only doing one thing, having that consistency builds trust that they know that you will show up, when and where you'll show up, and that can go a long way as well. And similar to what I recommend, I always want you to start where you are with whatever you'll actually do, because I can tell you all day long how I've seen Fortune 500 companies do it, and I've seen the most successful multi-million and multi-billion dollar companies do it. And the most successful entrepreneurs who are doing it on their own with maybe a little outsourced project here and there. But if you're not going to actually do it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So we have to find what works and what you will do. So that's a good segue into our tips. I think that you have for the audience, you're going to share some really great information and I'm excited to hear it too. So share with us. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, and couldn't, could not agree with you more about the consistency versus authenticity. It's absolutely spot on. Um, so my tips for you listening today, again, no matter where you are in your business journey, these are always standby tried and true for me and my clients. Uh, number one, if you are at that point where maybe you've hit a plateau in sales, things aren't flowing in like they used to, uh, nobody's buying your current offer, something that I always suggest, and this can be a daily practice as well, just to, just to kind of double check yourself, is look at your current offer, whether that's um, a sales page that you have up, a, a landing page you have up, wherever your offer kind of exists, look at it, read through it, maybe skim through your video from your target's point of view and ask yourself, am I attracted to this? Is this attractive to me? Because at the end of the day, doesn't matter. You, you can try to pinpoint what it is all you want, but if it's not attractive, it's not attractive. Okay, so then you need to try to go back to the drawing board. So that's tip number one. And tip number two is no matter how big you grow, starting out or you're the CEO of a multi-million dollar company, take one sales generating activity each day. And that could be um, adding an extra call to action in your stories or your live stream. It could be reaching out to a potential client. It could be reaching out to a potential partnership or collaboration, but take that step every single day, no matter what. Um, Cause one of the worst things that I've seen happen with several of my clients is you grow and you scale, and then you get a little too big for your britches and you put everything on autopilot. And then all of a sudden it stops and you're not in the habit of selling anymore. And it's like, you're starting all over again and it is miserable. So don't stop the sales generating activities. That is what is most important in your business. I agree with both of those points. The offer one, to go back and revisit your offer pretty regularly. I get questions all the time on, I've run a Facebook ad and I'm getting a lot of visits to my page, but nobody's buying. Mm -hmm. what, what's wrong with my ad? And I always respond when I see that question, if you're getting traffic from your ad, then your ad is working. Yeah. What you need to look at at that point is your landing page, whatever page they're landing on. And don't get caught up in terminology of, well, I've never made a quote landing page. Whatever page you're sending them to is where they land. So yeah. if they are getting there and they're not converting, and we're talking if you have zero conversions, a conversion is going to be a percentage of your traffic. It's not going to be everyone. But at that point, if that piece is performing poorly, you need to look at it. Is the call to action clear? Are you asking them for the right thing? Are you presenting information that they expected to see based upon the ad? Right. Is it attractive to the right customer? All of those pieces goes right back to what you said you know, same thing. The offer has to be attractive. And if you're driving ads to it and it's not converting, there's a reason why. Exactly. On that same point, the ad is doing well. The ad is getting people to the page. It's the page that's the problem. And it could be, again, it could be the copy. It could be the imagery. It could be the pricing. It could be the actual offer. It could be, where did you put the button on the page? And um, you know, it, it, you don't have to be an expert in these things. That's why you outsource an expert to, to build your landing page for you. But um, the, you know, the best thing that you could do if you don't know what the issue is, okay, we'll ask five of your targets to walk, walk through it. Ask five of your targets to visit that page and tell you what they think, what's wrong, what they buy it. I mean, they're the ones that you're selling to. So they're going to have, the, they're going to tell you what you need to change. And sometimes it's as simple as, and this is why you want to do that kind of review regularly. One of my clients, she had been a client and I'd set things up for her and she came back six months, a year later. And she's like, you know, I changed the, you know, the offer and the ads and everything a bit since then, but 
you know, now suddenly nobody's buying. And when I went and looked, her plugins on her website, you know, had updated and there was a conflict between one and the button didn't work anymore. Gosh. So it can be something really simple. And if you're yeah. not reviewing it, you won't know. Right. And going back to your other comment about no matter where you are, solopreneur or CEO, you want to be involved in those sales activities daily. The last corporate job I had, which was a multi-billion dollar company, I was CMO and the CEO chose when we were moving the company headquarters, rather than have a separate office from any of the 2021 field offices moved into one of the field offices because that allowed all of us to actually see see clients now we might not have gone over there and sold to them directly but you could hear the conversation you could hear the type of questions they were asking you could hear their pain points when they talked about it and just being around that buzz made all of us so much better at our work and then he would actively go to each of the offices and you know interact with staff and clients and do those pieces but it definitely changed the dynamic of what was happening in our headquarters part of the office and the efficiency and effectiveness of everything we were putting out not just in marketing but all of the departments as well as we grow higher in our own organization and become more of the leader and less of the person doing hands-on work sometimes we can tend to lose that activity yeah. from our day and you need to actually schedule it it's that important you need to put it on your calendar and do a bit of it every day so i love that tip yeah now i'm curious what right now in your business has you most excited oh uh, well, uh, like I said, the memberships that I have planned to come out with, I have actually never run a membership before. Um, back when I was doing spiritual coaching, I built up that business into six figures from, again, high-end one-on-one clients and live group programs because I, I, just, I, love, I just love showing up live and doing group programs. But at the end of the day, that still left me hanging, not creating any sort of passive, consistent income. It always required me to show up. So um, a lot of the clients I work with right now, uh, we are working on exactly what I'm going to do for myself as well. But that's setting up passive recurring income through memberships or subscriptions. It's really something that I'm very passionate about teaching and sharing right now, because a lot of people think that it has to be overwhelming. The tech side, no matter what platform you're building on, it's actually pretty simple, um, especially like even your payment service provider, whoever you use, you probably already take monthly payments um, if you're a service provider anyway. So that's not an issue. Uh, having it designed or, or setting up where your content is delivered doesn't have to be difficult. And you probably already have at least six months worth of content, even if you've just been in business for a year, you can take uh, content that was um, uh, had the most engagement that you created on social media, and you know add a little bit more to that, make it more juicy, make it more valuable. And there's you know your first month of the membership. You can um, collaborate with other business owners you're friends with, and send out uh, subscription boxes along with your member, like there's just so many creative, amazing things that you can do that is a win-win for everybody, I feel. Um, so that is what has me most excited in my business right now. <laughs> Wonderful, that does sound exciting. And I do like that you pointed out, people tend to not think they can reuse their content. And I am all about, I don't care if you've posted it on social media five or six times over the past year, People have to see something 11 times before they even start to register that you exist. And so repurposing your content is one of the easiest ways to not have to sit down and recreate it every time, but repurpose it over and over. And even these podcasts that we're doing, I curate the content across multiple platforms. Part of it is as a way to get you more reach and me more reach as 
the host and the guest. But part of it too is that I know it takes that many times of seeing it before the message starts to sink in. And we've always got some great information on these episodes and I want people to have that access to it. So you can go grab some of your pre-used content and you can share it again in a different place, in a different way. If you put it as a post, do it as a you know one minute video, whatever you can do to save that time and recreating the wheel. So I like that you pointed that out. Now, here's your chance before we gather your contact information, because I know some people are going to want to get in touch with you. This is your chance to ask me a question. Yes. So I want to pick your brain and hear your opinion on what trends you're forecasting in online marketing over the next year. Good question. One thing we've definitely seen, and I hate forecasting after COVID. Oh, right. <laughs> you know? Like, oh, you know, Vicki, what's your forecast for 2020? It was not a global <laughs> pandemic and the relating changes in business everyone had to do. So yeah, I'm, I'll give this to you, but keep in mind things change. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of the things we did see, think about the uptick in convenient services accessible online. And I'm talking like things like Uber Eats mm -hmm. and food and grocery delivery, the meal delivery, the subscription meal boxes. And you had mentioned some subscription boxes yourself. Those things, they were around. A lot of people were already using them, but there are some people who had never touched them that have relied on them a lot in the past year. And that activity has spurred people to realize, oh, oh, you know, I can do Uber Eats. Oh, well, I can do grocery order from Whole Foods and it just magically appears at my door. Think about how it's presented. It's easy. It's, you know, it's right there on your phone. It's relatively inexpensive. You pay a delivery fee, but that convenience is worth it. I know when I go grocery shopping, it can take me two hours to go through Same. this and go down my list through the store. I can sit there and order it all and put it in a cart online in like 15 minutes. And if I use that voice assistant whose name I can't say at the moment because she'll answer to put things on my grocery list, I don't even have to do it if I'm using Whole Foods. I just click and it magically populates it. Yeah. Using technology for those conveniences, I think will continue. And it has spurred a lot of people to get creative in how can my business offer some type of similar convenience? And I have a really great idea that's huge in my head and I'm having to pull in my, I've got, my son is a software engineer. My other son is in school for computers. My husband is a software engineer. It's going to take all of their brains and maybe more for this really cool idea that I have that may not get launched this year because it's so big, but that's okay. So that's one of the things. Another thing I think we will see more and more augmented reality and virtual reality. My exercise used to primarily consist of teaching ballroom dance or ballroom dancing. Mm -hmm. And when you have to, you know, quarantine and you can't get more than six feet, you know, you have to be six feet apart. Ballroom dancing doesn't work. I still, <laughs> I still do it with my husband a little bit. It's, you know, it's different when I'm having to actively move the whole time. Sure. He's, he's not as good of a dancer as me. He knows this. I'm a <laughs> teacher. He's not. <laughs> And I didn't want to go to a gym because we had people in our family that we didn't want to risk getting sick. Sure. My husband bought an Oculus Quest, which is the virtual reality goggles. And I was just playing it with, with it one day. And I'm like, oh, I know they have that dance central on VR. And that was fun. But I randomly found a game that's a fitness game with this beautiful, just unimaginable scenery while you work out to fun music and you're moving and the coach is telling you you're doing a good job. And I have done that workout religiously 
since he bought the Oculus Quest and he used it two times. Like he played one game twice and he's never touched it since. And I've taken it over <laughs> and it's my fitness. But they've also been adding because I watch the more, you know, marketing and business related pieces, but they have more and more now virtual meeting capabilities in these. Yeah. So Zoom is great. But if we could do one where it actually felt like we were both sitting at the same table, yeah, it's just the possibilities there are just now, I think, moving a little closer to more mainstream. I would not be surprised if there were some online meeting platforms like Zoom that came up with really robust meeting capabilities inside of virtual reality. I would not be surprised to see that at all. And augmented reality, very similar concept. AI, artificial intelligence is becoming more and more mainstream. We, we all do that. We all use that a bit to a small extent on things such as the, the guest application process for my podcast. Mm -hmm. That's all for the most part automated. Right. So not quite the same as AI, but, you know, we're all using some level of similar technology. I, I think AI has a long way to go to be really fully robust and affordable and efficient for yeah. smaller companies, but I think it will grow. But in general, for marketing specifically, I see social media as less and less effective. We all know that the reach of our posts, even if you have a great post, the reach of post is just tanking. And unless you are paying and doing pay-per-click advertising, which can still get you good results, but it's declining a bit as well. And so I think people will start relying more on the other forms of marketing that maybe they've shifted away from a bit, such as email marketing. Email. Mm -hmm. The increase in the number of podcasts has gone up this past year because people had more time. They didn't have their commute. And so they had yeah. time to consume more video, audio content. If you have, if you've wanted to do a podcast and it is not for everyone. So don't listen to me and think I'm telling all of you to go out and get a podcast because I am not. It is a lot of work. It's not one of those things that you're like five minutes a month. Okay, I'm good. No. It's a lot of work, but it can give you a lot of benefits. So if you've had it in your plan for a while and you're just not there yet, this might be a good time to consider adding it because the number of podcasters is only going to increase. And anytime you can get on at the beginning side of a trend, you pick up on some of the wave and get to ride the wave and carry the wave a little bit rather than being behind it and trying to catch up. So don't everybody... Be like, I've never wanted to do a podcast, Vicki, how do I do it? Because I'll probably say, you shouldn't yet. Mm -hmm. You need to wait. It's, it's time and labor intensive to do it even at, I'm not even doing mine to the level that I plan on getting it to by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So mine is still, and I had planned different stages, a very beginning stage where it was just basically me doing my talking and YouTube and my SoundCloud accounts, just hosting the stuff I was making. Mm -hmm. And right now we're at it where I'm being more intentional and have more strategy, but it's not my final step that I envision, which I will get to. So I think we'll be seeing more audio video podcasts on different platforms in general over the coming year. So those are kind of my predictions and not a lot different than a lot of my predictions have been for the past several years. Mm -hmm. Just some of them are a little bit more the urgency level. It, sure. It's already happening. It's already rolling. Now's a great time to add some of these pieces if you can, or start planning for them if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't, couldn't agree more with you on, uh, you know, I think AI has a long way to go, but even in the uh, business world, we're seeing, for example, uh, a lot of copywriting AI platforms are coming out. 
uh, in my opinion, they have a long way to go. <laughs> they, they, I've, I've, I always test the new shiny things so I can make recommendations to my clients. And I have not found one yet that I have recommended. They're Same. trying, but all they're doing is pulling old copy from archives. And I'm like, you know, other people's copy. I'm like, it's not quite there, but I, I see that it could get there. Right. Yeah, we're crawling. We're we're crawling in that direction. Baby so, steps. <laughs> don't don't rely on AI copywriters yet. If you're tempted to do it, it's better for you to write basic stuff. It doesn't have to be beautiful. Write your basic stuff. Don't rely on them yet. But there, I can see. I've seen a couple of them that I think will get there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they they're they're um, they're okay if you need a basic lay foundation. I think it depends on what type of copy we're talking about as well. Um, I've seen some do well with some things and not with others. Like, like, let's take something basic, a headline, for example. Okay, it's going to help you get your juices flowing. It's going to write, it's going to pull up headlines and uh, written like persuasively. And so that's great, but you can't rely on it for a whole entire blog post or your entire landing page copy. But if you have writer's block, if you're not a good copywriter, if you need help formatting it, it 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 can help for sure but don't absolutely don't rely on it but it is cool to see it is cool to just see how we're evolving just the things that I think some people you know are afraid but I I think it's more exciting because if we have the ability to use technology in ways that we haven't before sure will it take away some craft some services that normally were done by a human absolutely but on the other side of that what does that mean for the business world what is the business world going to evolve into what other things are we going to come up with as humans that we can create and offer and do instead you know i i think it's i think it's really exciting and i definitely agree with you on the uh you know the on demand the delivery the subscription and um I tell all my clients, well, how, you know, how can you add that as an element to your business? Because that's how everybody's brains are thinking right now. And pretty soon it's going to be the norm. It's going to be expected. So how can you offer something on demand, subscription, delivery, whatever it is now, get ahead of the curve, like you're saying with the podcast before it's a little too late. Yeah. And I can't wait to host all of you inside my virtual reality, whatever. <laughs> I, I have no idea what that's going to look like, but yes. you know, I, I do like testing those things first and VR is fun. So we may be having this podcast in some fantastic location virtually soon. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll invite I'll you all. There. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Before we go, I'd like you to share how the audience can connect with you. This will be down in the description. We'll put links to all of it. But for those listening, go ahead and share with us, please. Absolutely. So you can find me at thejenniferneal.com. That's Jennifer and like Nancy, E-E-L.com. That's my website. You can also find me on Instagram, instagram.com at thejenniferneal. And on Facebook, I am it's Jennifer N, facebook.com slash it's Jennifer N. I am active on Instagram and Facebook. I'm quasi active on LinkedIn, not as much, but um, you can find me there as well. Great. We'll be sure to do, like I said, share those links down in the description area so that people can connect with you. Any last thing before we go? This has just been, <laughs> this has been an awesome conversation. I feel like I want to talk to you for like two more hours. I want to dive deep into, I have so much to say about the VR and the, and the augmented reality and the, the just, there's just, just so much that we could dive into. And this has been a really beautiful, valuable conversation. So thank you. No, I don't have anything else to add. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to have some special opportunities for podcast guests coming out, trickling out in the next couple of months. So cool. we'll have some more ways to connect, hopefully you with the audience. And I love the tips you've shared and can't wait to connect with you outside of this on some of your platforms. Yes, yes, absolutely. Me too. 
All right. Thanks for joining us today. And as always, if you have marketing questions, you can visit the website, vickywoo.marketing. Bottom right-hand corner, we have a chat bubble icon and you can ask your question there, or you can always shoot us an email or find us on one of the social media platforms. And we will either answer you directly, or we may even use your question on an upcoming episode. While you're here, check out our other videos and subscribe to our channel so that you never miss the latest marketing tips.